Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest in Elementals uh, talks, virtual talk series. Let me just give it a, a moment before I do my, my full introduction for everyone to connect their uh, audio um, and make sure you can see our wonderful panel that we've uh, arranged for you today. Um, just a bit of background for those, obviously, who don't know. Um, Elemental is the online community for professionals in the heat, water, air, and energy sectors. So all of the vital elements that make up the built environment. And um, we're looking at, at those about how we manage those in the built environment, both now and into the future. So a bit of context, as we know, um, the UK has a very ambitious plan to create a net zero climate by 2050. Um, and that net zero picture is complex and it is multifaceted. It's, it's critical though, as a community that we all come together and drill down into how each sector can really play their part to um, achieve those ambitions. And that's what we're, we're trying to do today. We've brought together an expert panel um, of some of the UK's leading built environment net zero experts. Um, and we'll be asking the question, are the buildings um, that we have today ready for, are we ready as an industry rather for the sustainable buildings that we're going to need um, in the future? So we have uh, very briefly, uh, I'll just very quickly go around of who we've got on the panel. Victoria Burroughs, uh, Director of Advancing uh, yeah. Net Zero at the World well, Green Building yeah. Council. Um, fantastic to have you with us. Um, Rosanna Lorne, Brandon yeah. Partnerships Director at Project yeah. Utopia. Um, Andrew War, who is a founder and, and the director at War Thistleton Architects. Uh, Zesis uh, Nicoludis, I'm so sorry, Zesis, if I'm saying your name wrong. Um, and um, James Griffiths from Yupuna. Um, uh, fantastic to have them with us today. And uh, Michael Bevan, um, a fellow director, global automation leader at Arab. Um, what a wonderful uh, panel. I'm going to. Um, shut up in a, in a moment and let you guys as the experts sort of take the floor. Um, before we do so, I do want to point out to um, everyone listening, we've got some questions. We're going to have a lively debate here today, but we'd love to answer your questions. So do use the Q&A feature to, to submit them and we'll have some time um, towards the end of our, our debate where we'll pick up as many as those. Um, as possible. And um, so we'd, you know, we'd really love to hear from you. We'd love this to be kind of an interactive debate. So before um, we kind of get started, I did, some people may have been listening to us yesterday when Zesis um, and James um, shared the, the industry report and, and the research that um, Yupanoa have, have sort of produced. And I, I'd like to probably start there, if that's all right, Zesis, just with a couple of key messages, a couple of key highlights from that report. You know. Uh, from that, do you think we're ready for the sustainable buildings of tomorrow? Thank you very much, Ben, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, so obviously we want to stay ahead of, uh, of the changes. We always need to listen to what the industry has to say. Uh, and, and this is why we conducted a research among 200 industry professionals, including uh, architects, consultants, contractors, and developers, in order to understand their perceptions around net zero, among other, some other topics. Um, so some, some of the findings around net zero, um, only 4% of the respondents think that the uh, UK construction industry can meet climate objectives without a major change uh, to the approach that we retrofit existing homes or we build new homes. Um, one third of the respondents uh, believe that net zero homes will, uh, will not be a reality by uh, 2040. Um, only 10% uh, of the people that have been uh, surveyed uh, think the construction workforce is actually fully equipped to deliver the sustainable houses that we need. Uh, more than 10% of the industry think that the uh, UK will never be able to take all new homes off the gas grid and replace it with uh, low carbon uh, heating systems. And finally, two thirds of the respondents feel that uh, more investment in new product development is needed from uh, manufacturers uh, to enhance water, uh, water delivery efficiency, uh, which will actually improve building design. Um, so based on these findings, we can all understand that there are several challenges that the industry need to overcome in order to stay uh, on track to delivering net zero buildings in the coming years. 
uh, and actually a need for greater awareness, uh, more training, more modern designs and new product innovations uh, were repeated topics through the, uh, through the whole report. Okay, great. Well, let's dig into some of those challenges um, now and let's try and bring in some of, of our other esteemed panel, panelists to get, to get your take on this. Uh, you know, the key challenges in achieving net zero buildings in the future and perhaps how they can be overcome. Mike, would you like to, to start us off? Sure. Um, as you alluded to, Ben, I mean, it is a, the, the, the challenge is it needs lots of people to come together and work and work for a common aim and a common ambition, um, which is taking leadership. Um, and we've been um, building, delivering buildings of various sizes of the last 20, 20 years are net zero in embodied and operational carbon. And it's growing in number. Um, but of course, we start thinking about the materials we use, what we build it with, sequestered carbon content, that kind of stuff, uh, sector economy, reuse of stuff. Um, and then the operational stuff, architects, engineers, uh, suppliers, contractors, commission all that kind of stuff is working together and so one of the big challenges is 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 getting um a team led in a way and with uh, the right client and the right um sort of perspectives to to build these things out of town we've done buildings that are you know uh, beyond zero carbon construction and with pv to 100 percent that kind of stuff in towns higher density high rise that the one of the topics in the in the white paper much harder we have to think about the criteria that letty have produced to think about how we can generate the renewable uh, energy to supply these buildings so actually really complicated um, so we overcome it by, by teams coming together, uh, and I'm appreciating that this is at the moment a small but growing, in our experience in, in Arab, a growing part of our client base looking to be the most sustainable, really committing their own targets. But again, it's still a, a small subset. And I think that's one of the big challenges and also things like circular economy building, uh, but at the moment um, immature. So lots of potential, but I think at the moment quite a small part of the market. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, I'll open it up to, to anyone else, perhaps. Um, Rosanna, would you like to, to jump in on that? Yeah, I think um, I definitely agree with that. Um, it's definitely bringing people together. There's a lot of silo work actually in this industry at the moment. A lot of people are innovating and a lot of people are doing amazing things, but um, a lot of people don't actually hear about it either. So I think this bringing to people together is really, really key. I think that actually education. I don't think the frameworks um, are robust enough or um, easy enough to understand and follow. Um, I mean, you talk about net zero, but there's different definition for net zero for the UK GBC than it for say the UK BCSD, whatever. Everyone's playing to a different tune at the moment. We don't have a singular understanding or a singular goal. So we've got to bring these people together, but we've got to unite people on a mission. And that mission still isn't very clear. There isn't a clear roadmap. There isn't a clear definition. There isn't a clear, you know, this, this and that. So people are all trying to do their own thing, which is all perfect and it's all great. But we're still not entirely sure how we're going to reach that target and actually what that target is because it feels like it's moving quite regularly so i would say you know there's products that are available i think there's processes that are available but the, until we can actually understand where we're going it's very difficult to actually bring them all together in a united form mm. Does that makes sense for sure i want to bring victoria and the and the um, world green building sort of council in here is that sort of part of your role and and it's a lot, be great to get your take on take on this yeah absolutely i mean thanks ben i i mean first of all i'd start with you as part of um some of the webinars that we've been running over the past few months including a, a november dialogues um session for the for the cop 26 program um we included a poll where we asked people what they thought was the greatest barrier in achieving a common vision towards sector decarbonisation and uh, perhaps not surprisingly the highest two ranked were lack of regulation and lack of available finance or incentives um, less surprisingly um, was that uh, the lowest ranked were the um, ability of industry to deliver the industry knowledge of the likes of Michael and, and others um, you know to be able to actually design these buildings when asked and then the other lower lower sort of ranking item was the was the availability of um of solutions in the market so we know that those solutions are there we know that we can achieve very high performance buildings even if we just park the concept of net zero for a while and not you know worry too much about different definitions or how to achieve it in different um, buildings what we can all agree on is that whatever type of building we should be designing as high performance based on what's available today as possible what was more concerning was that the another higher 
ranked um, outcome from that was a lack of demand and knowledge, uh, you know, awareness from clients about why net zero is important, why it's beneficial to them, why they should be asking for this in advance of regulation. And that's something that we really need to be championing for. But until we reach that, um, that sort of blue planet moment for the building sector where we have, you know, people using more uh, reusable bottles and single use plastic, we need the same consumer demand to drive this for the industry. Um, we simply won't get there until we're sort of demonstrating that they need this before they know they do. Mm. And um, some of our green building councils, for example, are actually going to require, so Green Star has just been completely revamped in Australia, and they're actually going to require to you, as part of submitting for your certification level, to explain why you've chosen not to design this building to net zero which is a hugely powerful approach. If you're required to justify why you've chosen to make that material choice over another, or why you've chosen to build this building less efficient than current market available technologies require you to, it becomes more about a GC of care on behalf of the design community, instead of waiting for that client and, uh, and regulation demand. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it sounds a little bit like there's kind of the there might be, there's some stuff that we can be develop our awareness from, and certainly we're gonna come now I think to back to sort of Zesis and James and talk about what are the, the things that are available, how do we drive that awareness, what, what are the potential you know, synergies that we can make uh, today and, and then we're going to come on to I think do we need more sort of systemic change or do we need more consumer driven change and how we change the industry and I want to bring Andrew in on that in a moment but let's go back to if that's all right to, to Zesis or, or to James. Um, to chip in, you know, from the, the manufacturer's point of view, from sort of, you know, today, um, you know, what sort of what synergies can take place to assist us in developing a uh, and delivering a more sustainable future in in construction? Do you want to just just take that point? Um, yeah. So obviously, first of all, um, I believe that all companies actually should have sustainability embedded in their philosophy, their business plan, uh, especially the ones that are trading in the construction sector, because their action, uh, their actions are actually uh, have an impact on uh, the building and living environment. Uh, so from a manufacturer's point of view, uh, what we need to do actually is to drive the change uh, to a more sustainable construction uh, through innovation, pioneering, engineering, and by having sustainability at the core of, of the uh, new product development plans. Uh, so the products and the solutions must actually focus on delivering more sustainable buildings. So, for example, we uh, we recently launched a new range of pre-insulated pipework uh, for district heating systems, um, the, the Ecoflex VIP range. Uh, that ensures lower heat losses, which actually increases the overall efficiency of the network, creating a very sustainable solution. And then other than that... Uh, new products uh, should have uh, reduced environmental impact actually within the whole life cycle uh, from cradle to grave. Um, and this must be start to be taken into account uh, when it comes to project specifications and not only for products, but for whole solutions too. Um, it, it seems that many project decisions are taken only by accounting the initial cost of a system and not the long-term operational costs for the whole life cycle of the project and this is something that must change in in, uh, in the sector as well mm -hmm. this is kind of getting on to say i, I want to bring andrew if that's all right it, you're in now is do we need a really systemic change in the way that we procure pay own buildings i'd love to get your absolutely your absolutely ben i think that not only how we procure and pay for them how we own them but also how we design them and what we prioritize as well. So I think we need to, to really, I mean, these changes that we're talking about are fundamental and, you know, and they need to happen, you know, within the next 10, 15 years to really have a kind of like to really, you know, have the kind of the level of change that's required. And in order to make those, you know, in order to kind of transform this industry, we can't, I think, carry on as normal and help, I hope that technology will save us. I mean, we need to, I think be rethinking the priorities of design as well. So it needs to be, you know, we need to be thinking about resource conscious design. So that kind of, that sort of 20th century modernism that we all sort of still celebrate in architecture and interior design, I think that needs to be rethought and reconsidered. And we need to make, we need to have different priorities. So I think we will begin to see fundamental changes 
in how our buildings are designed, how they're procured, how they're paid for, and I think ultimately actually how they look. The idea that we can kind of carry on as normal but put a solar panel on it, I think is not, it's just not sufficient anymore. And we need to, so we need to be rethinking these things. I think, you know, people were touching before on, you know, how, how buildings are paid for. And I think that, you know, the, what we're seeing is that the investment into the buildings that we're building is coming from a place at the moment, which really does care about the environment, you know, and that the kind of environmental and social governance requirements of different investors are really kind of making, a, a, um, having the kind of the most fundamental effects, certainly at the moment in terms of design. But the idea that we can kind of, I mean, Mike and I've talked about this often, but the idea that you can kind of like, you know, keep layering more systems and more sophistication into buildings to kind of have small incremental changes in the way that their operational carbon is reduced. At some point, we can't just kind of keep carrying on doing this. You know, they need to be far more fundamental, you know, um, systemic changes to, to, to kind of, to get this kind of paradigm shift that we need in architecture. Mm. I'm, I'm intrigued. I, I'd love to know what they, these sort of buildings of the future are gonna, gonna look like, because we'll probably all just have us, you know, visions of what buildings of the past have looked like and, and maybe we're, we're not thinking. And sure, and that's, you know, and mostly, you know, when one designs, it's not kind of like, you know, you don't have this kind of like Newton like flashes of inspiration. I mean, they are kind of, you know, it, it's a lot about kind of collages of things that you know and that you understand that you've seen already. And I think to kind of, so to, to escape out of that, to develop beyond that, you know, these are kind of, it's exciting times. Mm. You know, I think there's kind of like real opportunities for architecture and for design to make some, to make some real changes. And I it sounds like you know, we really need great to, opportunity. yeah, absolutely. Uh, to, to kind of increase more innovation. Mike, so did you want to come in on? Yeah, I, it's, uh, I'll just pick on Andrew's point. I think this, this thing about uh, a, a more sophisticated agenda for a building than appearance, so forth, and, and, and forming a kind of a, uh, following a, a style, I think, is going to be absolutely fundamental, and the, the, the fundamental drivers too uh, take systems out. You know, design a building that's more naturally um, creating an environment that's comfortable throughout the year. People adapt. Uh, really, quite a you know, this shift change in it's happening in some some um, corners of the industry, but to become mainstream. So it, it, it's and putting body all systems in that are more embodied carbon and more embodied carbon is just the wrong thing to be doing. How can we choose things that are going to put less kit in and use re, you know, reuse kit, use it in the circular economy piece? How can we reuse components, reuse machines that are perfectly good mm. and not throw them away or, or send them send them to a different country because they're somehow not good enough? Um, so those uh, this 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 change of how we again the procurement bit that Andrew talked about they, they were using circular economy principles to to have a symbiosis of a existing uh, product being reused on sites. Again, some clients have started to think about that. Uh, and how we can design using the uh, the schedule of the existing equipment into a new building as opposed to design new building and does the old stuff fit because that's never going to work mm. so it's re reprioritizing reordering of, of, of our agenda for buildings i think is it's coming but it needs to come so much faster and this and andrew's point about the speed of this needs to happen is is it needs to be a quite also like a radical shift and and i wonder we, we've talked about them in this group um about uh, legislation um you know one of one of the things about uh, empowering incentivizing circular economy those sort of things i think are are, are just was waiting to be to brought into the public domain mm, and, it, and it seems like what you're talking about here as well is how do we you know try new things as well how do we encourage more innovation in the sector try new approaches that might work um i'm not sure uh, rosanna from sort of project utopia your experience with this you know how would you like to see sort of the whole industry embrace innovation and like how, how can we how can we encourage that that to happen faster yeah i think that's really key because what we're seeing and what we've experienced as Utopia, because we are, you know, only a couple of years old, um, that this is a really a legacy industry. Um, it's traditional, um, it's based on legacy, it's reputational. Um, so we've found, you know, when we're putting forward for tenders, for instance, that our reputation isn't strong enough and they'll go for a standard volume house builder or, you know, looking at planning systems. I mean, we've had to, just to prove our concept here, we've had to build, you know, a number of sites, build on BRE Innovation Park in Watford, um, and we can go to America and they're like, cool, put up a pilot with us. And we're working with like a, a state over there, putting up a pilot already. We haven't had to jump through all of these hoops that we have to within the UK. Um, and it's quite, um, it can be quite frustrating because, you know, when you, you we, we have 
um, which I would describe as a really great product to um, as a solution for a lot of the stuff that the industry requires. But because um, we are a young company, um, actually getting your foot in the door is a lot harder, which ultimately it's these innovators and these um, you know, companies that are starting to think about it differently, like you say, not just bolting on more and more things to their current designs, but actually thinking about fundamentally everything that they use from, you know, even supply chain to partnerships to the product, we're innovating our product all the time to make it more sustainable. These are the companies that really do have a lot of the solutions to drive um, huge impact change. But um, it's getting that out there and creating that trust. So for me, I guess my almost plea to the industry is to embrace that a lot more. You know, when these innovative companies come to you with a solution, take the time. They might not have 10 years behind them. They might not have, you know, finance books that rack up like this that show some sort of security. But what they do have is um, passion and a different way of thinking that could actually provide a solution um, in an industry that's worked very similar for many, many years. Mm. And I think that's where um, a lot of our hiccups are, is that the industry is a bit reluctant to change and embrace um, all of these in incredible things that companies are doing to actually drive it forward. Mm. And just, I want to make it kind of some practical, ask, us, ask the panel you or to share some more sort of practical examples, things you're seeing, you know, because you just talked a bit about um, in America, the, the, the difference in terms of the legislation and, and perhaps therefore the speed that you're able to sort of work at. But are we able to, like, moving from just a UK focus, looking abroad, looking for best practice examples that we might be seeing um, elsewhere? Practical examples. Um, James, not to pick on you, but uh, to maybe draw you into this um, conversation now, would you like to take that one? Yeah, certainly. I mean, obviously, there's a lot with regards to innovation and innovation is important. You know, we can't stand still and just assume that what we've done in the past is going to be right for us in the future. But in the same sense, we do need to take stock and look at what's worked. Um, there's been a number of words used today with regards to Blue Planet, silos, approach to net zero and fundamentally we need to take the learnings of what's worked in the past you know just taking the word blue planet um from a moment there from um and, and looking towards sort of what has been already done with regards to that activity and how that's been used in construction you know in 2008 Upanol were instrumental with Gaisley construction and also um, a number of other key partners to build one of the largest green logistics centers. But it sat there empty for three years until JCB, the giant plant manufacturer, needed a new sustainable policy and wanted to show its credentials about its manufacturing. So a lot of what we are developing and taking for granted, let's, for, for argument's sake, history being incorrect, there are still some really good examples that we need to move forward. And talking about how we look at supply chains and, uh, and procurement models, you know, there are great things moving forward in uh, the education sector at the moment where you've got integrated project insurance, where all parties by interview and best for project design are assembled to give an overall view of what they believe to be correct for projects here and now and for the future. And some of that isn't just directly related to innovation for net zero. Um, a byproduct of it is that by good design, good practice and having all parties engaged, net zero is a byproduct of moving forward. And the project I'm referring to there is uh, the recent IOTT at Dudley, uh, that Dudley uh, Education have put forward for a, a new facility for their students of the future looking at construction techniques. Their aims weren't to achieve net zero, but to look at how construction can move forward for the new generation of workforce that is you know, now and for the next 20 years. And the initial assessment and the outline for that is that when you look at currently what they've done on their development sites, we've actually achieved net zero by default. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Really interesting. Um, go on. Sorry, Victoria. Are you going to jump in? Yeah, there? Ben, I wondered, I really love that point that James has made. And I think it really touches on what you perceive to be of value on a particular project. And in this case, you know, there's a very specific reason why you might end up at the net zero outcome. Um, you know, we've heard about case studies all over the world where it might be a lower carbon option has been pursued because of buildability or, um, you know, the, the kind of program effects on program. And there's all sorts of different reasons. And I sort of spotted a question in the chat box if I might jump to that, Ben, because sure, it's yeah, kind of linked to this, in, this yeah. point because around, you know, does a healthy building necessarily mean a more expensive building? And that depends on what you classify your baseline as. I think we're all agreed that current levels of regulation and client demands are not fit for, fit for purpose on today's standards, let alone what's going to be necessary in a few years time. And so it's not about whether something is more expensive, it's about what you value more. And we're seeing projects being evaluated on a carbon or energy budget or an you know or, or a productivity gain um consideration mm -hmm. a kind of broader value proposition than purely considering you know your operate your uh, capital cost against your operational costs and i think that as we've you know heard from angie that sort of business model is just not going to stack up in the future yeah andrew you did you, you you mentioned this before but you know in terms of seeing a change in a change in demand you know and and from investors and in terms of um, environmental and sort of social responsibilities in in reporting is that kind of enough that you think we're, we're seeing at the moment like could you expand on that like um... yeah i think it's i mean it's not enough no <laughs> you know um but i do think that it's something that we're beginning to see um and the kind of the acceleration of that is, is quite rapid so i think that it's something we're going to see a lot more of very quickly and this kind of notion around a sort of stakeholder capitalism rather than kind of one that's just based purely on profit. The idea that actually you're involved in what you do, you're involved in what you invest in. You know that we're talking about businesses that are kind of set up to begin to solve public problems. You know, really kind of actually that kind of, you know, just, you know, responses based purely on profit, I don't think are, you know, are going to be as relevant or as what, you know, as, as kind of as a sort of primary factor of what people are interested in for much longer. I mean, I think, you know, we have to, um, I think the last year, the shocking year that we've just all kind of been through is a rude awakener in lots of different ways. And I think it has kind of, you know, it's definitely allowed people to um, begin to understand that, that fundamental change is possible. You know, it does happen. We've quickly. just been through a year of fundamental change and we can do more of that. You know, if you kind of, all you have to do is kind of, you know, strip back some of the difficulties and see the opportunities to realize that, you know, we're probably the most important humans that have ever, exi have ever existed, you know, because this next 15 years is up to us to solve. Yeah. And, and, and we should probably make, you know, clear, we're not saying that profit is obviously not important. It's just, a, it, it's a, it's a piece of the pie. It's, the, it's longer term. It's the it's oxygen, a longer term. But it's not a reason to live, right? Like it's, it's not. Uh, and it's also, it's kind of looking at kind of like, you know, looking at investments on a kind of longer term rather than just looking at kind of um, immediate profit. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, a, another thing that both Rosanna and Michael have just been touching on as well is this kind of is ideas around collaboration and that, you know, that this needs to be a collaborative response the kind of uh, the relay race that we all kind of like run in our industry where one person passes a baton to the next, you know, in terms of responsibility, in terms of, you know, where the architect might draw something and then expects the engineer to problem solve that for them. I want a building that looks like this. <laughs> Mr. Engineer, go and make that carbon zero. You know, it's kind of like, these aren't possible. These aren't fun, you know, and I think that, that the, the kind of responsibilities to kind of, to end up with the kind of buildings that we need and that we want going to, uh, you know, run through the entire industry. Mm -hmm. Brings me on to the point that I'd love to get um, the Victoria uh, and the rest of the panel, if you'd like to, to touch on, which is probably kind of, a, it seems to sit at the heart of this discussion we've been having, but who is ultimately responsible for delivering on this goal, on, on net zero? How, and how much at the moment would you say, perhaps the overall industry, um, is taking today how much responsibility so mm. victoria yeah absolutely i think uh, i think angie's answered that question for us for a deep end because 
you know, again, that sort of tradi traditional or sort of typical process of, of you know, a very linear mm. um, procurement model as part of construction, again, needs to change. It me needs to be more integrative. It needs to be collaborative. I think as you, I wrote this down, Ben, when you introduced us, right, this problem is complex, it's multifaceted and critical, right? That's what you said. That means that it's not the responsibility of one slice or one stakeholder within the entire value chain of buildings and construction to solve. It's far too big a problem to just rely on the architects, rely on the clients, rely even on legislators and policymakers. You, we all have a responsibility to make, as, as Andrew said, as part of that design process on new buildings, but also as investors, as manufacturers, as, as sort of producers of different products and equipment. I think everyone within that, that um, ecosystem of the building and construction sector needs to be questioning whether you are truly doing enough at a project level or as an organization to enable this market facility to facilitate and enable this market transformation because if you are a barrier to someone else because you're simply doing the bare minimum we're just not going to get anywhere and so we're seeing examples of engineers and architects who are taking a client brief even contractors who are taking a client brief and, and say okay I, I see your brief and now I'm going to show you how you can do this at net zero within the the parameters of your brief and it's all about just you know it really needs a deeper understanding of what that means and um, in some cases it can be achieved at net zero cost there's no additional cost to the to the um the, the production of a building it's just changing the way that you're that you're designing that net zero in and you know as we've already touched on long into the future not just thinking about how the building that's being designed today will perform on the day it opens but how will it be performing in 30 40 50 years time yeah okay well look thanks for that uh, victoria i think we're all kind of uh in agreement with you i, th I think i'm just going to ask you all now um if you had uh a sort of a magic genie or magic wand um and you had one wish for the future for, for for achieving this goal what would that be it could be policy wise it could be um otherwise I, i'm going to go around very quickly around the panelists and then we're going to take some of your questions which have been coming in through the through the chat and through the q a box so if you've got other questions do um post them there now but um thesis maybe you sort of started us off maybe i'll come to you uh again first what would be your what would be your wish um my wish would be for construction people to uh, be more open to change and start thinking out of the box. Um, we need, we all need to start using solutions that actually comply with renewable sources, products that reduce the environmental impact of uh, a development, and actually think of the uh, of the carbon footprint of everything that has to do with the whole construction um, life cycle of a project not only what goes into the building but what comes from the feasibility study to the handover and to the operation mm -hmm. great thanks thanks Jesus. Uh, uh james would you like to go next yeah i think uh an understanding and a better constructive argument around policy i think the word net zero gets used far too often without the substantiation uh, I also think that we need to better understand when comments or, let's say, impact for things like removing uh, housing off grid or not using gas and what fundamentals that has across the wider aspect. You know, there's one thing to put a renewable source onto every new building, but what impact does that have right the way through the building, right the way from the ground up fabric? to the rest of the HVAC, to occupancy living, and all that needs to be answered rather than just making a broad statement that we'll be off gas grid for new build for X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Rosanna, I'll come to you next. Yeah, I think my um, wish would be that, you know, everybody within the supply chain, even down to, you know, the actual consumers who live in the buildings or work in the buildings that we create, realize it's their responsibility. I think it ties into everything that we've been discussing about, you know, everybody doing their part, realizing that they, everybody has a responsibility to be working towards this, not, not to be palming it off, not to be saying it's somebody else's um, responsibility. I know yesterday in the webinar we did, I think um, they came back and said the fact that most house builders think it's the um, no, most homeowners think it's the house builder's responsibility to be building homes that are energy efficient for them to live in. But ultimately, they they will 
de develop to demand, won't they? So it's everybody's responsibility and for everybody to take that responsibility and to really own it. Um, but that would be my wish. Okay, thanks. Um, M Michael? I suppose it's a theme of, of um, everyone playing their part. What, what I'm seeing is uh, getting, is, uh, I suppose it's conservatism, um, uh, a lack of willing to grasp ideas and things. So we've got a, a client who has lots of buildings. They want to do the right thing, build with timber, build with other materials. Uh, and you know, insurers are saying, well, we, sorry, sorry, we're not, we're not taking the risk on that. Sorry, you know, a whole lot of us are not doing that. Um, so is this, and they're, they're the blockers in a sense. We have teams doing, doing as far as they can the right thing. And then there is this issue of, of, of blockage. Um, and and, and it's, you can't get beyond that. So if you can't insure a building, you can't build it. You can't you know, operate it. It's, a, it's a, one of those things. So I think it's um, it, it's uh, that that everyone would everyone, my wish I suppose was that everyone could could get on board and see there is uh, potential to take on ma managed risk take mm. on um, those things and work through them understand them uh, there's no such thing a, a company won't take on blind risk that's uh, a step into the dark not into the light so really I, I wish that people would take a step into the light. Okay. Can I, Thanks. Sorry. Can I just add to that as well? Um, I, I think one of the key things you know, like we talk about ESG investment and things like that, but it's almost like, you know, that collaborative approach again, like if accreditation programs were rigorous enough and developed to be able to inform investors and insurers and all that kind of stuff to make that route easier. It's all that collaboration, isn't it? So if, if accreditors can get this program in place, then that makes it easier for investors and insurers to be able to come in and go, okay, you qualify for ESG investment. Okay, you qualify for this because you've met this and this through this accreditation program that's been specifically developed by us to make sure that you meet that. So it's all of that coming together to manage the risk too and just talking. Mm. Mm. And a lot more. Collaboration. Andrew nodding uh, vehemently there and also ask, answering questions already on the, on the chat, which is great. Um, what's your wish? Andrew, is it related to that? It is. Um, it is. I, it's a bit boring, my wish, actually, I think. I worry that I kind of, I think that actually, not ending with you. <laughs> I think we have to, we have to prioritize retention of our existing buildings. Mm -hmm. And that has to be the thing that we prioritize you know, in every development decision beyond all else. You know, we need to immediately remove VAT from, you know, from refurbishing existing buildings. We need to keep as much of the existing building stock we have as we can. And we need to adapt and reuse and recycle. Those have to be the first answers to every question. You know, building brand new shiny glass buildings needs to be the last answer you know, to a problem, not the first one. So a little bit boring, but we have to kind of get a lot better at make, do and mend. You know, we need to use what we've got, repair what we've got. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And, and last but not least, Vic Victoria, what was yours? Yeah, so I think um, I think my, my sort of one wish that I think could really truly transform the way this sector works together from this kind of responsibility question to the, you know, the, the financing to the collaboration, I think is about having um, greater transparency around performance as a part of planning conditions. So if you were being granted planning permission that it's all based on a performance-based outcome, that will inevitably be, mean that the design team are working together to find those solutions, not based on sort of just meeting a U value or just meeting a, an EUI, but actually achieving an in-use performance-based um, result that means everyone's working towards that same common vision. And the same goes for a life cycle approach. That means, Andrew, that you, if you've cho chosen to build new rather than um, building existing, when actually that was the best outcome in terms of carbon, that you are having to explain why. And you're incredibly, that, that the projects have to be very transparent in the fact that they've, they, they've decided to make that choice. Um, if, you know, there's enough momentum and sort of pressure back towards these systems, then we will see changes like hopefully that VAT issue because we're seeing that happen around the world, but we need to drive up the demand for that. Great, well, thank you so much uh, uh, panelists for that. You've had the easy questions now. Now we're gonna go on to um, some of the harder ones that have been coming in from um, our, our listeners right now. So we'll start with um, Christian. Uh, who, us the provocative sort of challenging um, question. Do we really think that we need more products and more kind of construction developments, um, perhaps that we, that we were talking about earlier? Um, should we not be looking at places, he said, suggests that like Brussels and learn from their experience about how to accelerate sustainable construction 
in a short period of time. You know, maybe we already we already have the the products and the construction methods, but um, we need to look at other examples of other cities where, where, where they've done that. Anyone like to, to take that first? Andrew, and then- uh, I can, James I mean, the thing is, is so, many of these, so many of these policies that we're seeing emerging across Europe, across continental Europe, are, you know, are from technologies that have been developed in the UK. You know, whether that is kind of tall timber buildings, whether that is some of the kind of, you know, the kind of mechanical and passive solutions we come up with. And yet the UK government and local government lags behind, you know, increasingly um, in terms of supporting innovation. The, the construction industry in the UK has, a, you know, has a tiny amount of money spent on research. And like Rosanna, you know, we're beginning to work increasingly um, in the US and in Europe and finding the appetite for innovation, the appetite for sustainability to be so much more ambitious. Okay. Um... Uh, James, did you want to chip in on that? Yeah, I mean, going back to the point before, we, we've seen developments, uh, you know, as a manufacturer, we, we have to stay with innovative technologies, but fundamentally, we don't change our core principle. We do need to adapt to what we're seeing for best practice across the world, not just in the UK. And I think that starts by reviewing what we've done and agreeing what's worked and what hasn't worked taking very, very simple stock that under four heating was done by the Romans as the first kind of principle, yet obviously today it's still referred to as a new technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So, so we definitely should learn from our past. I, Michael, was there anything else you'd like to add? Well, well, just that there are some parts of what we do and, and get involved in that that do rely on on uh, rapidly changing technologies, you know, tra transportation, you know, electric electric drives, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, changing boilers to heat pumps re requires development of technologies that 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 change some fundamentals. You know, putting in batteries instead of generators, you know, in built in in commercial buildings is is quite a big step if you're not to take up half the basement or whatever with a load of batteries. So there is a role for that, but there's also you know taking the point. There's lots of things we learn from around the world, even attitudes. So it's really interesting. A big commercial development we were refurbishing the attitude of the american side of the client said actually why don't we just reuse all the main plant and we're still going oh okay normally it's uh, taken all out but yeah we'll give it a go and we reused 90 percent of the central plant for a building that was then reoccupied with a with a, a decent lease of 10 years 15 years um so actually we, we can and do learn you know neighbors coming in from australia i think we are quite a good culture at learning too as well as um, you know propagating ideas um and a lot of the solutions we're using have been around for a while and it is the case of choosing those so i, I think i really support that point of learning from others and their experiences i think that uh, and it's not a case of inventing a widget for the sake of it but there is a place for invention in what we do yeah okay great thanks thanks thank, thanks folks um christian hopefully that one answers your question lots of lively opinions uh, about that um we've we've sort of already touched upon the the, the sort of second point so i, I won't labor it unless anyone wants to to which was the question of is it a fair assumption that healthy build is an expensive building? You know, we, we, we've talked a bit about, you know, it depends sort of what we're measuring and what the, what we're valuing really there that, that Victoria, that, that sort of you talked about. Um, does anyone else kind of want to ship in on that? Or are we comfortable? I think we've perhaps covered that quite a bit and we've got plenty of other questions to move on. Michael, just just, just yeah. a point about healthy buildings. Um, we're seeing much more po post-pandemic issues for air, like, you know, um, uh, clean, clean air, uh, clean systems that, that can propagate air through a space in a, in a more healthy way, taking away contaminants. So I think there's actually the, the um, um, Andrew mentioned it, the stake, stakeholder driven brief, which is more, more than, which is actually still focused on, if you like, money making, all that sort of stuff, but it's actually focusing on those people that get, bring the value into the the, um, the companies and things that occupy a space or the people that buy the flats, buy the accommodation. So we've got a lot of lot of interest in post-pandemic design. And if that, if the vaccination gets rid of that, that's fine. Um, but uh, thinking about those those issues mm. of healthy buildings, I think is, is very current. We had a period of sick building syndrome when when just driving down energy consumption was the only thing that mattered and we've come back back out of that and air fresh air rates mm. in, in buildings and commercial buildings particularly very strong topic of conversation and into post-pandemic design so i think it's a, it, it is becoming a, a recurrent theme sure and it's you know exactly it could be different things not just not just cost you know if, it, if it's costing our health as well um in these types of buildings that's great um what else have we got? We've got a couple of questions in the in the chat. Um, this one's from Jeremy Becker. Um, what could local government do to better encourage or enable innovative builders over standard uh, volume house builders? I don't know. Rosanna, do you want to uh, 
take that one or anyone to chip in? One of the things, I mean, that's quite a broad question um, because everyone's experience is different depending on who you're talking to, the local authority and things mm. like that. But um, one of the things that we've really tried to do is to get to know the local authority um, and really understand what their goals are, what they're trying to achieve, what their challenges are, so that we can ensure that we're the correct fit for their problem, whatever it might be. Different local authorities have different goals in terms of where they want to get with energy efficiency. They have you know, different communities, they have different existing housing stock and all this different stuff that they're all playing with. So we've really taken the role of, you know, can we get to know you? Can we solve a problem for you? Um, what are they? And then we've really honed in on working with the ones that we know we have a solution for and we can work with um, quite um, quite quickly rather than, you know, trying to force down the door of somebody who might not be quite ready for what we have or um, they've got another challenge that they need to solve before it's whatever we can offer them. So we've really taken the approach of collaboration, talking to people, getting to know people and understanding how we can be um, a solution to their issues. OK, great. Anyone else to comment on that? Any experience from working with local government or, or if you want to expand on uh, out from that? If not, I'll, a few quizzical faces, I'll, I'll, um, I'll move on. Um, I guess that there's, a, there's a sort of follow-up question that Jeremy asked, which is, which is also related, you know, and it becomes, um, there was a bit of a, an exchange in the chat, so I'll just summarise um, that for people who can't see it, and then we'll, we'll, we'll bring that into the debate. But um, Michael suggested that, you know, profit margins aren't, aren't as great for sustainable developments, perhaps maybe that's what's holding back rather than necessarily available finance. And you know, Andrew mentioned about, you know, we're seeing um, plenty of available in investors willing to um, invest with you know socially environmental um, goals. So I guess you know does the question more become about how do we convince local government authorities or or whoever of of the long term value or or to convince them to focus on value in different things? And I think Victoria, maybe you made that that point earlier. How do we change someone's mindset of what they seem to value today, which maybe it would be great if they valued yeah. something else. Yeah, I guess the premise of the question is that sustainable development costs more, right? So I'd be interested to know from Michael and Andrew in, in your experience, you know, based on not just mm. there is finance around because we're building buildings, it's more about how you reapportion that finance into more sustainable solutions instead of seeing it as a premium on top of something that might have been built already without those targets. Mm -hmm. I think if it's an add-on, then it's always going to be more expensive, which is why I was talking about kind of, you know, approaching design from an inherently, you know, kind of like low carbon perspective. And if you do that, then I don't believe that it should be more expensive. I think you can point out, you know, the advantages. I mean, we, as a practice, we've been building tall timber buildings for 15 years. And only recently have we begun to get clients who want them. I mean, that's sort of who want them to be timber <laughs> but you know because for years we built buildings in timber by proving that they were faster and more cost efficient to build in timber you know as well as being low carbon but i think that so i don't i think it's about making those design choices early it's about being collaborative in that kind of sense and um, you know as soon as you start thinking about you know sustainability or low carbon as being an add-on or an addition to what you do, then of course it's going to be more expensive because it is by nature additional to, to you know, to the underlying to the underlying kind of project. So it is about systemic change. It is about kind of like you know a paradigm shift of your values in terms of design. Mm -hmm. I thought uh, if I, experience, experience of that one's quite an interesting one. So um, we also find that there's a very reductivist attitude to how you cost things at various stages. If you take an overall cost plan and you have a, you know, what you want to achieve with that and you trump forward and then at the end you look back at it and what you spent. We uh, did, we designed and, and built uh, the, well, the world's first sustainable data center. It was in, in Germany, in Frankfurt. Um, and the cost plan when we started had no green credentials. We talked with the client, worked it through, you know, and the, so worked, worked it through. Um, and then it became the first Lee Platinum data center in the world um, and was using green power from, you know, uh, renewable sources, all sorts of things. Um, and it's, it's, end it's end cost was less than the original cost plan. So, but, you know, so it's actually within the tolerance of the build, um, who's building it, what they're building, how, and is, is all the bits and things that you could say, you could pick out and say, oh, we won't have variable speed pumps. They, call, they, they cost 3,000 3, euros more. 
So it, it's, it's in the holistic view of a cost plan and mm -hmm. taking the view of a project as a whole and its benefit as a whole that you it, it really come, comes out in the wash. I think when we have a very reductivist approach, it often happens of taking components out and picking them apart, that we have this this this, this issue, this difficulty. Um, and as, as Andrew said, the value of the project, is it done six months early by using certain technologies? What's the value in that? What's the value being able to let it more quickly to more tenants? Because you've got a bit bigger reach to green tenants as well as tenants that want to you know not, not necessarily have that view yet. So again, it's, I think it's taking a broad view uh, and in, in that sense um, what, what we do is is affordable and within the tolerance and the clients generally are, are you know don't don't have this perception of spending a load more if you are spending a load more then as Andrew says it, it's it's you're wondering why you're doing it is it are you doing the right things for the right reasons um, interestingly James point about um, we did the right things for the right reasons the target was actually lead gold we achieved lead platinum because we did the right things for the right reasons and it added up to being more than some of the parts so that's you no know, interesting lesson without building the couple of respects. Absolutely, absolutely right. We're gonna, Thesis, did you want to come in quickly? And then uh, just yeah, just uh, I want to yeah. jump in there in, in terms of how we uh, might be able to change the perception of people. I think it, it uh, has to do with also with uh, educating the audience and, and prove them with facts that actually what, what an alternative solution is proposed to, uh, is going to work uh, and is going to provide benefits in the long term, uh, even if it seems that it's going to be more expensive in the short term. And I think this is the actual foundation of the whole sustainability discussion around both building environment and also corporate sustainability as well. It's all about the, the uh, long term, not the short term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, great points. Right, a couple more questions we've got. We've got time for. Um, this is a uh, perhaps kind of a, a very broad question, but it'd be interesting to get some different perspectives on it. Uh, anonymous attendees we don't know who's asking but which sector is leading the way within net zero um, and which has the most room for improvement so i don't know if we want to take it at a sector approach or if we want to just pick on certain examples that maybe we're, we're we've kind of seen in in um in your work james you wanted to perhaps jump in on that yeah i think again when you start to decide which sector which segment which part mm. of the design takes precedent, then you're ultimately relying on everybody else. Um, it was mentioned earlier that we've all got a part to play in this. And, you know, sitting on the on, on what is quite a serious subject with regards to plastics, you know, the education of what is now in the industry and what's coming through from the youth is that plastics uh, are killing the environment and crippling the world. But that's in one facet and in one particular type of use within a particular segment, primarily around the food industry of single use plastics. But ultimately, what is being done to educate, obviously, the youth and all the new uh, talent that's coming into the UK now and in the future to actually understand all aspects of construction and all elements. And going back to where we sit, there is too much silo mentality. You know, mechanical is mechanical, structural is structural. If we start doing that within segment, we have exactly the same scenario. And then it will continue with the same problem in the future where we all stand there looking at everybody else to make the decision rather than standing up. Or it will always lead to traditional tenders where price against equal or approved and propose a spec change. If we don't stop that, then it makes no difference which sector. Mm -hmm. Victoria. Yeah, if I could, if I could add to that, Ben, I, I absolutely agree with you, James. And I think actually to take that one step further, that actually if you're not doing, you know, playing your part and doing what you can within your what, what's within your control in order to help contribute to that transition. Um, then you know you're at risk of, of being behind the curve when regulation comes because it is coming. Uh, we're seeing it already being implemented in cities across the world that can move a lot faster than federal or national level. Um, you know, in building in certain cities in the world are going to require you to build to net zero now. Um, it's just a matter of time. It, it's it's not a case of, of if. So it's it's about preparing yourselves and each each component of our sector for that future. We simply can't wait. For the concrete sector to decarbonize production of concrete or steel to decarbonize itself we have to be creating that demand um from from the demand side actors okay 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 let's um move on 
Kerry asks about yeah, 80% of buildings uh, of 2030, um, so 80% of the buildings that we'll have in 2030 already existing. How do we balance innovation in new buildings with the need to, um, to retrofit? And obviously, uh, Andrew, your, your policy wish was kind of um, all around this is, you know, work with what we have. So um, I assume, you know, actually we do, we do really need to recognize that, you know, 80% of buildings that we're going to have, we, we really need to have a big focus, I presume, on on retrofit um, rather than the, the new build or any comment on that? No, absolutely. I mean, I think even that kind of 80% probably kind of takes into account quite a lot of demolition of existing buildings as well. Mm. So I think that it's, you know, it's about, uh, I mean, I think that, you know, we need to do both. It's not really, it's, I don't think there's even a kind of a balance necessary. We need to do both. We need to prioritize retrofit from a carbon perspective um, and, uh, you know, we just need to, it, all the, every decision that needs to be made needs to be made with carbon as a priority. Great. Okay. Also, um, also just, just to add, I add sure. about, it's also materials, plant, you know, it, a lot of that exists and we can reuse it and we can repurpose it and recondition it and, or, and, and warranty it. Um, so it's not just the buildings and they have, okay, they may have the facade and the structure, but also the systems inside it. And th this is something that, again, we were try trying with several clients to try to build the circular economy and with government um, and communities to build circular economy thinking and circular economy activities like renting, like lighting as a service, lifting as a service, you know, building as a service, as opposed to buying components and, and so forth mm. um so i think that's a really again something uh, one of my other wishes is that you know it would really really incentivize circular economy um thinking and, and action so we can actually get this the supply chain running to supply buildings that are can take warranted products to put them in the buildings and you know keep this keep the um energy content up of all all the stuff we've already made as well as the buildings and the, and the structure okay okay um a couple of Interesting question. So Michael asks, um, and given we've been talking about, you know, collaboration and, and the, the, the problem of sort of looking at individual silos and sectors doing their own sort of things, it, well, if contracts which are sort of then subcontracted out and, you know, sliced up, are they a big issue for sort of sustainable buildings, um, given given those issues that, we, that we've talked about? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's all about, you know, there's, there's another question here about kind of, you know, uh, problem focus on building and fire safety at the moment. Does that overtake decarbonizing buildings? I mean, it's all about silos, silos, whether it's kind of like in the construction industry or silos, whether it's in government, you know, do MHCLG speak to Bayes? Do they speak to DEFRA? They don't speak to each other. MHCLG CLG will make decisions on, you know, on one thing without consulting on whether that, you know, what are the kind of like implications for low carbon construction on the other, you know, so all these things mm. need to be far more collaborative, far more joined up. Yeah, the left hand's not talking to the right hand. No, um, and subcontracting well, and the whole notion of kind of design build as well, I think is really, you know, it's, it, it, it's what's got us into the problem, so many of the problems that we're in, mm -hmm. you know, no, no proper accountability or responsibility. Okay. Yeah, Don't and Ben, um, you know, again, even what we can, we've talked about it before, what we can learn from other other parts of the world, you know, in um, the US, there's sort of the integrated design approach, where it's a completely mm -hmm. different type of, of contract model, where again, every, every part of that design or project team are, are invested in the outcome, the performance of the building and, and like share actually in, in, a, in a part of the profit and loss as a result. So everybody's kind of, um, as a result, not working in silos that's literally a contract solution to avoid that kind of um siloed working which again really helps mm, mm, absolutely absolutely okay uh final question which is a slightly different angle which is actually uh, i think also as a consumer myself and we, we all are right when we go and um try and you know move house buy a house um rent a house that live in one um as a consumer, it can be quite difficult, isn't it, to find uh, low or zero carbon homes to live in. Are there any steps um, that they can be take to overcome this? We're talking about sort of creating demand um, from the ground up. Perhaps that's where we could could finish today. I don't know if anyone has any 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 thoughts that they'd like to throw in the mix on that one. I think the demand is there. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think the demand is there. I think the demand is kind of. You know, we've been told by so many house builders for so many years that our job was to provide them with the sufficiently mundane white box that nobody could complain about. And I just, <laughs> you know, I think those days are over. And I think that kind of 
you know, I mean, I know it's a kind of hackneyed term, but it's like, you know, was the market ever riper for disruption than now? Mm. I don't think so. I think they're just waiting for someone to step in, waiting for people to step in, you know, and do a better job. Because the one that's been done so far is really not up to scratch. I'll just add on that as well and just say, you know, they are quite scarce at the moment, these um, sustainable homes, mm -hmm. because we're getting there. So you're right, it's very difficult for people who are looking for them. So I think maybe the answer to that is to start doing more investigation and educational and data driven understanding so people can see, you know, what is the incentives for house builders to do that? How many people are actually looking for this? Is it, is it actually worth more for the sustainable? Will they get five grand more for their house or whatever it might be? Do people care about mm. this stuff? And I think um, to actually drive, um, you know, the actual building of it so you can go and buy your home sustainably, I think we actually need to drive bigger insight into consumers and who cares about it and how much they care and what that looks like as value. Okay, brilliant. We are um, out of time. I know a couple of people have had to, had to sort of drop. Um, Panas, I just really want to thank you all for your uh, for your time, for your insights, um, really lively discussion and debate. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, um, Yupana, um, uh, Zeusis, uh, James. Um, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Rosanna. Uh, wonderful to have so many of you all together. I, I, I thought it was fantastic. For everyone listening, thanks as well. And do go and check out. We've got a whole series of talks this week. Uh, the next one is at, in starting in an hour's time. So if you haven't checked out that, um, I've just posted the link um in there uh you can sign up uh, and listen to that we're, we're with vega uh jim will be uh hosting that session it's all about um more about kind of uh managing risk on these sort of bigger projects how specifiers can be sure um to get what they want on a job uh so if you're interested in that do please um sign up to that uh and if not we'll see you there then and hopefully see you again soon um and thank you once again to our wonderful panelists you've been a great Great audience. Thanks Thank very you. much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.